Chapter 1 Jamaica Inn It was a cold, grey day in late November, and although it was now only a little after two o'clock in the afternoon, the dark of a winter evening seemed to have come down over the hills, hiding them in mist. The air was cold, and in spite of the tightly closed windows, it found its way into the coach. There must have been a small crack in the roof, because now and again little drops of rain fell softly through onto the leather seats. The wind blew hard, and on high ground it blew with such force that the whole body of the coach trembled and struggled to stay upright. The wheels of the coach sank into the holes in the road, and sometimes they threw up mud against the windows, where it mixed with the rain, so that any view there might have been was blocked out. The few passengers sat close together for warmth. Mary Yellen was sitting where the drops of rain came through the crack in the roof. She brushed them away with impatient fingers. Although she was only forty miles by road from what had been her home for twenty-three years, she was already beginning to miss it. The courage, which was so large a part of her, and had helped her so much during the long unhappiness of her mother's illness and death, was now shaken by this rain and wind. She remembered the letter from her aunt. The writer said that the news had shocked her, that she had had no idea that her sister was ill, because it was many years since she had been in Helford. And she went on, "'There have been changes with us that you will not know about,' I no longer live in Bodmin, but nearly twelve miles outside it, on the road to Lanson. It's a wild and lonely spot, and if you were to come to us, I should be glad of your company in winter time. I have asked your uncle, and he does not object, he says, if you do not talk too much, and will give help when it is needed. He cannot give you money, or feed you for nothing, as you will understand. He will expect your help in the bar in return for your room and meals. You see, your uncle is the landlord of Jamaica Inn. The letter was a strange message of welcome from the smiling Aunt Patience she remembered. A cold, empty letter, giving no word of comfort and little information, except that she must not ask for money. Aunt Patience, with her silk skirts and delicate ways, the wife of an innkeeper. So it was that Mary Yellen found herself travelling north in the coach. Villages were scattered now, and there were few smiling faces at the doors of the small houses. There were almost no trees. The wind blew, and the rain came with the wind. And so the coach rolled into Bodmin, grey and unwelcoming like the hills around it, and one by one the passengers collected up their things ready to leave, all except Mary, who sat still in her corner. The driver, his face a stream of rain, looked in at the window. "'Are you going on to Lanson?' he said. It'll be a wild drive tonight across the moors. You can stay in Bardman, you know, and go on by coach in the morning. There'll be no one but you going on in this coach. My friends will be expecting me, said Mary. I'm not afraid of the drive, and I don't want to go as far as Lanson. Will you please leave me at Jamaica Inn? The man looked at her strangely. "'Jamaica Inn?' he said. "'What would you do at Jamaica Inn? "'That's no place for a girl. "'You must have made a mistake, surely.' He looked at her hard, not believing her. Then he called over his shoulder to a woman who stood in the doorway of the Royal Hotel, lighting a lamp. It was already getting dark. Come here and reason with this young girl. 
I was told she was going to Lanson, but she has asked me to leave her at Jamaica Inn. The woman came down the steps and looked into the coach. It's a wild, rough place up there, she said, and if you're looking for work, you won't find it on the farms. They don't like strangers on the moors. You do better down here in Bodmin. Mary smiled at her. I shall be all right, she said. I'm going to relatives. My uncle is the landlord of Jamaica Inn. There was a long silence. In the grey light of the coach, Mary could see that the woman and the man were looking at her. She felt cold suddenly and anxious. Then the woman stepped back from the window. I'm sorry, she said. It's none of my business, of course. Good night. The driver began to whistle, rather red in the face, as one who wishes to end an awkward situation. Mary leant forward and touched his arm. Would you tell me? she said. I shan't mind what you say. Is my uncle not liked? Is something the matter? The man looked very uncomfortable. He avoided her eyes. Jamaica Inn's got a bad name, he said. Strange stories are told. You know how it is. But I don't want to make any trouble. Perhaps they're not true. What sort of stories? asked Mary. Do you mean that people get drunk there? Does my uncle encourage bad company? The man did not answer. I don't want to make trouble, he repeated, and I don't know anything. It's only what people say. Respectable people don't go to Jamaica Inn any more. That's all I know. In the old days, we used to water the horses there and feed them and go in for a bite of food and drink. But we don't stop there any more. Why don't people go there? What is their reason? The man paused. It was as if he were searching for words. They're afraid, he said at last, and then he shook his head. He had no more to say. He shut the door and climbed into his seat. The coach rolled away down the street, past the safe and solid houses, the busy lights, the scattered people hurrying home for supper, their figures bent against the weather. Now the horses were climbing the steep hill out of the town and, looking through the window at the back of the coach, Mary could see the lights of Bodmin fast disappearing, one by one, until the last was gone. She was alone now, with the wind and the rain, and twelve long miles of empty moor between her and her journey's end. She sat in her corner, shaken from side to side by the coach. On either side of the road, the countryside stretched away into space. No trees, no paths, no houses, but mile after mile of moor, dark and empty, rolling like a desert to the unseen horizon. No human being could live in this country, thought Mary, and remain like other people. The children would be born twisted, like the blackened bushes, bent by the force of a wind that never stopped blowing. Their minds would be twisted too, their thoughts evil, living as they must among rough bushes and hard stone. She lifted the window and looked out. Ahead of her, at the top of the hill on the left, was some sort of building standing back from the road. She could see tall chimneys in the darkness. There was no other house near. If this was Jamaica Inn, it stood alone, unprotected from the winds. The horses came to a stop, clouds of steam rising from their hot, wet bodies. The driver climbed down from his seat, pulling her box down with him. He seemed to be in a hurry, 
and kept looking over his shoulder towards the house. Here you are, he said. Across the yard, over there. If you hammer on the door, they'll let you in. I must be going on, or I'll not reach Lanson tonight. In a moment, the coach was away down the road, disappearing as if it had never existed, lost and swallowed up in the darkness. Mary stood alone, with her box at her feet. She heard the sound of the door being unlocked in the dark house behind her, and then it was thrown open. A great figure walked into the yard, swinging a light from side to side. Who is it? came a shout. What do you want here? Mary stepped forward and looked up into the man's face. The light shone in her eyes, and she could see nothing. Oh, it's you, is it? he said. So, you've come to us after all. I'm your uncle, Joss Merlin. Welcome to Jamaica Inn. He pulled her into the shelter of the house, laughing, then shut the door and put the light on a table in the passage, and they looked at each other, face to face. Chapter 2 The Landlord He was a great big man, nearly seven feet high, with a lined face and dark brown skin. His thick black hair hung down over his eyes and round his ears. He looked as if he had the strength of a horse, with large, powerful shoulders, long arms that reached almost to his knees, and big hands. 